very glad to introduce our presenter for this session, Helen Louise Mills, who is a mental health consultant from the Madison area, and she will be discussing supporting people with mental illness. Helen, whenever you're ready. Hi, thank you for the introduction. I am very excited to be participating in this webinar with you all and in this conference. I do have to start with um, telling you all my love of libraries. Probably someone, everyone along the way has said that, but I, when I was in middle school and we first moved to a new town and I didn't have any friends yet, I spent all my time at the library and the librarian showed me the set of books that were like in my age range sort of so we're talking 12 years old and i read through all of those i just gobbled them up and she's like oh okay let's find you some more books and some more books and i feel like i read every book in that library that summer um and i'll just that summer will forever sort of be my library summer um and since then of course i've had great experiences you know i couldn't have gotten through grad school with the great librarians at the uh, university system and i'm just libraries have always played an important role in my life and they play an important role in community life and i'm sure that that's something that you're well aware of as and how you are mm -hmm. we i yeah. think we're not seeing your slides yet so oh okay that's hmm. Well, right now I only have the I only have the um, logo up, so we're not missing anything. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. That was not. That wasn't meant to be shade on your logo. No. Your logo is great. <laughs> All right, I'm pressing the share slide button, and it's just making a little clicking sound. This is so funny because we just had it um, working. Oh, here we go. Show Got it. Screen. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. Oh, what a relief. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Proceed. Thank you. Well, okay. Now, there we go. Um, yeah, so libraries are community hubs. They certainly have served a significant role in my life. And here in Madison, where I live, I was um, grateful to be part of the sort of the library remodeling process that they were doing in my neighborhood. And it was a lot of community conversation about who, what is a library? Who does the library serve? What is the role? Um, and we're in a space in a neighborhood where there's this, there are a lot of unmet needs in the community. And so like, where does the library fit in that context? And what emerged is a library that shares space with the community center. And so it's, it's a fluid space that's joined in the middle by like a classroom space. And so youth after school can come in and out of the library as needed. Um, people in the community can do classes in the community space that the library hosts. So it's it was a great process to be participating in, and it was great to see the outcome. Um, and now I don't know how you all are participating, but with COVID, the online system has been really great. We order online and it's a drive up process. That must be a lot of work for um, the staff at the libraries, but it's sustaining us through COVID. So thank you for what you're doing. So today we're gonna to be talking about sort of a general overview of major mental illnesses, learn how to engage someone who's in a crisis and uh, resources for taking care of yourself and your coworkers. So it's not just about what's happening in terms of who walks in your door, but also how are you walking in on that day and what are you observing about your coworkers as you're managing not just COVID crisis, but just everyday life. 
So everyone has mental health. So it's the foundation for emotions. So how you think, how your resilience, your self-esteem, it's how you engage with relationships, your well-being. It's it's who you are and how you are in a in a good space in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit, in your body, in your physical body. All of that is your mental health. So everyone has that and it, it's important to foster that. But um, not everyone has a mental illness, although it is um, about, oh, no, I'm blanking on the statistic, but a significant portion of the population in the United States will experience some kind of mental illness, usually depression, at some point in their life. So sometimes depression, and we'll talk a, lot, a little bit about this um, later, it can be situational or it can be uh, an ongoing problem. But a mental illness is um, with the, the DSM-5, the what the American Psychiatric Association labels it, is something that um, changes your thinking, emotion, or behavior, and it's a, to a distressing level that it impedes your function in society, in your work, in your daily life, or your activities. And depending on the mental illness, it can be anywhere between three days to seven days. So have you been able to get out of bed three days? So have you been missing? And that's when they would then consider not a diagnosis, not a diagnosis, but maybe a um, the beginning process of identifying if you're experiencing a mental illness episode. So the most diagnosed mental disorders, and these are like the majors, um, are depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, and dementia. And they all affect the brain in very different ways. Um, you know, dementia is not like depression, but they all have some form of chemical change in the brain. And so depression, you know, is not the blues. Uh, depression is, and I recommend uh, that you, if you haven't already watched, watch a video on YouTube called Black Dog. It's an excellent representation of what depression and even anxiety, but depression looks like. It's just, it, it's a great resource for the community. It's a great sort of watch and then have a conversation about empathy and discussion about depression and education. Anxiety makes up the greatest um, number of diagnosed brain illnesses. Um, and in there, you can kind of lump, um, and anxiety, it's not just stage fright. Like I woke up and I had anxiety because I was, you know, going to present in this webinar, but actually it's, it's, it's something that, again, it impedes your ability to function in life. And so that's where the disorder comes in. Bipolar disorder, there are two, uh, bipolar one and bipolar two, and those are, and we're gonna talk more about bipolar one later on, which is mostly defined by a, a mania, so a, an elevated state. And bipolar two is usually defined with a more of a extended depression state. Schizophrenia is um, one of the most difficult brain disorders to treat. Um, and it really engages people in terms of, um, and we'll talk more about this, but their ability to engage in reality. And with dementia, as you know, it. It happens later on in life for the majority of the time, and it really is that deterioration in the fibers of the brain that affect cognitive, um, that affects, affects behavior. I also want to comment that um, there's been research, particularly on bipolar disorder, um, is that whenever there is an episode, there's actually damage to the uh, gray matter in the brain. And so, there's physical trauma that's associated with these um, disorders. It's not just a, a chemical imbalance that can be addressed with medication. There's also post episode, the need for the brain to physically repair itself the way that bones knit themselves together 
when they break. So who has a mental illness? You, you, for the most part, it's important to note that if you have a diagnosed mental illness, um, you're not alone. You're not alone. It can feel overwhelming. It can feel isolating. If you're experiencing something now that you're kind of tugging along, one in five adults experiences mental illness, which means that four people around you minimum are there to be a support. It means that either you know someone or you are experiencing a mental illness. But the great thing about that statistic is that there are four people around you. You can be one of those four people. Um, and one in 25 adults lives with a serious mental illness, which is um, the ones that I was referring to previously. And youth um, also experience mental health disorders. And what's challenging about youth is that it's too young to diagnose mental uh, brain disorders in youth because their brain is developing at such a fast rate. So a lot, there's early onset symptoms, but it could be almost anything. So you'll find that people will be diagnosing, um, physicians will diagnose youth with a whole bunch of stuff and then just kind of treat one at a time until they figure it out. Um, also, there's no known research or there is an increasing body of research for medication efficacy on youth. But again, with brain changes and growth at such a fast development, there's just, it's a growing body, but there are limited treatments for youth. So I don't know if you're able to read this very well, um, but this is a breakout of sort of what what a year of mental illness looks like in the United States. And it includes um, dual diagnosis is sort of co-occurring comorbidity. And it's a, it's when you have more than one and usually it's a co-occurring drug or alcohol addiction. So um, you often find that people with a serious mental illness also have an addiction or what is more commonly being to refer to as an unhealthy relationship with alcohol. So talking about the symptoms, this is important to note um, when you're thinking about mental illness in your context is that it takes about 11 years on average before an onset. So we're talking about a youth having their first episode at 15 and they're acting in ways that are erratic. And it's not for years that they may be receiving the treatment that they need for any number of reasons. So I will talk, I'm a certified peer specialist, so I'll share a little bit of my story that um, my first episode um, was my freshman year of college. And freshman year of college is so easy to dismiss like, oh, she didn't adjust very well to college. It was, she went, home, went away and she wasn't ready to leave home. Um, there were some cultural elements to that because um, in Venezuelan culture, <laughs> you don't leave home <laughs> until you're married. So I went away to college and that wasn't great. And it wasn't until I was 35. So it was 14 years, um, 15 years before I was diagnosed with a brain disorder. So that can be a long time for people to struggle. Um, and that's why the reduce reduction of stigma is so important. And hopefully when we talk about mental illness and self-care, it's important to support people around you who may not be receiving treatment and encouraging them to do so. So people who do get treatment, so again, this is the you are not alone part. This is, it's important to see that people are getting treatment and are successfully getting treatment. So, um, one of the things that is important to note with treatment is that when people have a brain disorder, um, dementia has is sort of a separate part because it has their 
care aspects involved, age aspects involved, um, continuing deterioration involved. So I'm gonna set dementia aside and just talk about the other four major mental illnesses. And what's important about those is that you can live a life of recovery. So having uh, an illness does not mean that your life is over as you know it. It used to be that like, oh, you have to quit your job and get something less stressful and go on disability and just limit your life and just, you know, live in a padded, four padded walls room. But actually there's uh, this emerging over the last 45 years, this emerging movement of recovery, which is great, and of, of being able to live your life fully. Um, and for that, I, I encourage you to get connected with NAMI, um, National Alliance on Mental Illness, which actually was started here in Wisconsin and is now a national movement. This is a breakout of what's happening in our community. This is, these are national numbers of what's happening in uh, mental health treatment and diagnosis for breakout by ethnicity and race. And this is what's fascinating about this is that LGBTQ, um, seem like, oh, 49% are receiving, um, but that's not the same it's a misleading statistic because it's not the same proportion of population, right? So um, what we know is that LGBTQ uh, plus community experiences mental illness at a higher rate and experiences suicide at a higher rate um, and are disproportionately stigmatized and so that number is of that small population there's an ingre an increased approach to treatment which is really important to celebrate so who are on the margins so many of the people that and i'm making a lot of assumptions about everyone on the webinar being a librarian um, or a staff in a library in a traditional manner. So um, I hope that you'll be patient with that because that's that's who I'm understanding is on this webinar. So people that walk in the door reference all the previous slides that we learned. Anyone can walk in the door, one in five people, but there's also the people who come into the libraries that are on the margins. So again, people who have a co-occurring disorder with substance abuse. So someone may come into the library and have these multiple issues going on. Um, we know that the um, system of incarceration that the prison industrial context, excuse me, prison industrial complex has become the largest mental health facility in the country, especially in Wisconsin. So it's the more people are receiving mental health treatment in jails than they are in hospitals. And homelessness is in and of itself a trauma and to double down on that with a mental illness is particularly challenging. So how to recognize what's going on. So someone walks into the library, what, are they a concern? Are they a disruption or are they quirky or are they a, 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 a danger to themselves or others? So what's important about our time together now is that this is not for you to diagnose people with, this is just how to, di how to respond. So how to recognize and respond. So I, I can't stress that enough that it's not about diagnosing, it's about supporting and responding. So symptoms of a mental illness, and I'll specifically focus on mania and schizophrenia because that's kind of like who comes into the library. And I also wanna stress that th these are also symptoms that you can look for in yourself and in your coworkers, like what's different? Are they talking much more quickly and their speech is disordered and they're talking really fast and they're moving from one idea to the next to the next and their volume is very high? Um, are they in an elevated mood? They seem euphoric. Um, they're easily distracted. They go from one thing to the next to the next. So 
in a work context, it might be that they're not able to finish tasks because they're moving on to the next thing. Um, there might actually be a situation where there are delusions. People feel like they're, they, it could be paranoia. People are out to get them. It could be delusions of grandeur, which is often one that you hear about. Hallucinations, a, a break from reality or hearing voices. Um, so those are things that you may observe someone who is in a crisis or an escalating crisis that either is in your library, talking to themselves, moving books around, walking around, sort of being, being like hitting the keyboard too hard or just even using um, inappropriate language. So what do you do when you're engaging with someone who is having an episode? And this is with someone who is in like where you've noticed there is definitely a problem here. Whether it's someone that you like a frequent visitor to the library or a one-time person or your coworker, you know, and some of this is pretty obvious. You speak in a low, even tone and um, it's important that you ask simple questions. Yes, no questions work the best and allow time to answer. So again, the distractibility is important here. So they may be thinking about something else and not hear your question or it takes time for them to respond to the question and get to the answer. So just wait for the answer or repeat the question if possible. Um, do not engage in the delusion or the hallucination. Be honest. I do not see what you see, but I can imagine that must be distressing to you. I do not hear the voices, um, but that must be um, scary for you. So don't engage, acknowledge that they're experiencing that, but you will lose all trust immediately. People know when you are messing with them and when you're not being truthful and that will immediately break trust. Um, allow the person physical space. It, it'd be great if they know that they can leave the space easily, go to the door, but leave your hands open so that they see. And this is something that officers are trained in mental health, uh, mental illness de-escalation is um, to leave their hands open because uh, an officer is trained to put their hand on their gun. <laughs> and that is like not what you wanna do in a mental illness crisis. So you wanna see your hands available, visible, um, and give them the opportunity to move around the space if they need to, or know that they can leave so they don't feel trapped. Um, minimize distractions. So if there's loud, if there's music playing, uh, turn down the music. If there's, um, if the copier is going, wait for the copier to stop, right? Like what is the, com what is the context that you're in? Try to sit down, try to sit down in a chair or on the floor um, and offer water. And we're going to talk about water um, in a little bit. Um, it's kind of become a joke, like drink water, drink water, but it's actually, we're going to talk more about that, but offering water, offering coffee, offering something um, will kind of change the conversation. It may, it may bring someone who's elevated down and say, oh yeah, I could use some water. And if they're actually drinking it, that's great because then that's helping to reset their breathing. So um, offering them to sit down, um, drink some water. Um, what if this is, is this actually a crisis? So sometimes things are happening, but they're not a crisis. So, um, and trying to identify between the two is important because are you gonna call the police? Are you gonna call a supervisor? Are you going to call um, a parent or a cohort or a spouse? Um, is this a crisis? So in the context, so do all of the behaviors in the previous slide, engage ask if they're hearing voices, right? So now it's not just noticing they're hearing voices, but ask the person, are they telling you to hurt yourself or others? That's important information to have because the voices are um, 
may may just be saying you're terrible, you suck, bleep 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 like language, um, but they're not actually um, there's no intent for harm. It's important that you ask. It's okay, and it's important that you ask if they want to kill themselves. So you're not putting the idea in their head. If they're already thinking about it, they will likely tell you, and we'll be happy to talk about. Can they respond to you even if unclearly? So they may answer questions very slowly. They may be distracted. And ask if they have the weapon. This does not mean they intend to use it, so don't freak out right away, like, oh my gosh, she has a gun. It's just ask, again, we're keeping our tone open, uh, our tone level and our questions simple. And if these are concerns to you, definitely if there's a weapon, um, call 911. And these questions are what you communicate to the dispatch worker so that the dispatch worker has the most information to relate to that police officer when the officer comes. And so they know it's a mental illness crisis. They've been trained um, in mental illness crisis de-escalation and having this information will help to reduce um, a tragic outcome. So it's also important to examine the policies and procedures of your system. So are you required to call 911 and in what circumstance? So if obviously, and I'll just, if these are happening, <laughs> call 911. So your policies I'm hoping would be in place that, um, that if there's a weapon that you would call 911. But is the person safe to stay? They're hearing voices, they're not disrupting anyone um, too much, and the voices aren't there to hurt the person. Can the person stay? Like, do you have an environment that allows for people who have a mental illness but are not in crisis to engage in the community? So can someone sit in the library and be part of their safety plan, right? So they may have worked out with their um, therapist and with their family member that they will not kill themselves, but instead they will go to the library. And then they just sit in the library and stare all day <laughs> and do nothing. And is that, but in fact, what they're doing is being alive and the library is a safe space. So what policies do you have around people sitting around the library, not engaging? Um, with books. Um, what if they're homeless and they're bringing all of their stuff? I know that there's a lot of uh, conversations about supporting people and families who are homeless um, in the library system. I know in Madison, um, it's, it's basically a day center um, for people who are homeless and it's a great um, service and um, safe place to be. Are they being disruptive or just unusual? So, um, you know, there's a sense in which libraries, the the stereotype of the, of the quiet library, and I will say my library is not quiet. <laughs> my library has little kids laughing and squealing, and it's got teenagers being teenagers, and it has people that are trying to read. And if you want a quiet space, my library is not where you wanna come. But if you wanna see your neighbors and get book recommendations and vote, um, that's where you go is uh, my library. So is there space for unusual, for out of the norm, for someone that is ticking and talking to themselves and, um, maybe saying a few inappropriate words, but not really engaging in the group? Um, or is it that that person is just making that person, someone else in the library uncomfortable? And is it wrong? Can someone be themselves and be sick and have other people be uncomfortable? Like, is the space for everyone? So symptoms of mental illness and how to help yourself and coworkers. So this is really looking at yourself and looking at your coworkers because you see each other every day. You see each other more than anyone else. If you're in a university system, you're together 
at three o'clock in the morning, at three o'clock in the afternoon. So you can really get to know each other well. So early signs of a mental illness, um, and this doesn't mean that this is what's, that you have a mental illness, right? Lack of concentration could be anything. So again, this is, excuse me, this is something that disrupts your life. It disrupts your everyday life for three or more days, for seven or more days. So something that happened to me is I used to, ne I, I owned one sweatshirt and this is not the same for everyone. Um, I now own many sweatshirts, but I owned only one sweatshirt and it was covered in um, spackle and paint. It was my work shirt for projects around the house. And I had been feeling down, down, down. And my husband said, hey, let's go out to dinner. And I went to dinner in the sweatshirt and he looked at me and he said, Helen, what's wrong? And I asked him, I, and I said, nothing, nothing, because of course, a lot of people are in denial of it. Um, and I had to, you know, make a, keep a strong face. Um, and he said, you've never left the house in a sweatshirt. You only wear that sweatshirt around the house. And he noticed that my appearance had become disheveled, that I was really no longer putting any effort into it. So it's not you know, if someone wears a sweatshirt to work one day, that doesn't mean they have a disheveled appearance. But if you notice a significant change in someone in um, their appearance, they've stopped shaving and they, and it's not um, a winter beard or you just, it's something that you notice, you know them well. Um, feelings of hopelessness, like they may start saying, like, and you may be feeling that there's no future, that you're stuck. Um, crying for seemingly no reason or feeling lots and lots of guilt and crying because of the guilt. Um, anger is quite common in, especially in depression, because if you're feeling down all the time, you, you may snap at people and that's normal. If you're always in a sad mood and you're always feeling hopeless and um, your life is just getting worse and worse. It's common for anger to be a response. So um, this is important to talk about in terms of yourself, but also um, the people around you. So warnings of suicide are talking about dying or wanting to die. I wish I were dead. I wish I weren't around anymore you're better off without me. Um, talking about feeling empty, hopeless, or no way out um, of a problem. And sometimes sometimes a, a life event can trigger depression and can trigger suicide attempts. So it's important to just check in. Um, strong feelings of shame and guilt I should have done better, I am not good enough. Um, social withdrawal or isolation, they, you're no longer going to work, you're no longer leaving the house, you're no longer um, engaging in society. Um, giving away personal items and tying up loose ends. And this is where you see people say, um, hey, I know that you really, you came over to my house and you really like this and I want to give it to you. It's something special. It makes me think of you. Um, something meaningful from their cubicle. Um, something meaningful of jewelry. So tying up loose ends, making, you know, keeping, cleaning up their workspace and making sure they've met all their deadlines. And again, this is a series of events. Um, and again, disruptive behavior, right? Meaning a deadline does not mean that um, someone is considering suicide. It's just in the context. And saying goodbye, um, people saying goodbye, calling people that they haven't spoken to in a long time and said, hey, I want to say goodbye. Um, so these are early warning signs of suicide. And this is the suicide hotline. And I just encourage you to take a moment to write it down. And it's 24 seven and um, you can call or the person can call. 
and get help. So they'll get screened for suicidality. They'll be connected based on their area code or based on where the person asks to the crisis line in their community. So throughout the state of Wisconsin, every county has a crisis line. Um, and so you can go to your county website and type in crisis line and the phone number will come up. So there, there are too many counties for me to um, look them up um, and post them on here, but they'll get connected to the crisis line and that crisis line will help respond to this person. And actually another option um, that I should have mentioned sooner is instead of calling 911 outside of the weapon, maybe you can call the crisis line. So if you have the crisis line, the majority, 80% of mental illness crisis calls are resolved over the phone with the crisis line. So a police officer will show up and literally call the crisis line. So you can try to de-escalate the conversation with the crisis line worker. And if the crisis line worker needs to, they can call 911. But if you aren't feeling like maybe the police is the right answer, you can call the crisis line in your county. But in a suicide situation, the suicide hotline is a great place to start and to refer to them or to ask for advice. So let's talk about suicide. Um, it's, it's incredibly stigmatized. It's scary and people don't understand it. There is more understanding now. Someone said that when someone is in pain, they're given dosages of morphine. And if they're still in too much pain, they will still not receive that last dose of morphine because it's a mortality dose. So they just have to kind of engage with the pain. Otherwise the next dose of morphine will kill them. And so in a situation of suicide, someone is in so much pain that they just want the pain to end. And the only solution is that last dose of morphine. And so it's important to intervene and address it clearly and with purpose. Um, so most people actually talk about their suicide before they do it. It's rare that someone will just snap and um, kill themselves. It's, it's not common. The majority of people will talk about their suicide in some way. And it's important to ask directly. And this is scary. And this is, a, this is good practice. Maybe you can have a mental, uh, mental health first aid um, at your community. It could be something you offer to people in the community or for yourselves as employees. But you need to ask directly, do you want to kill yourself? It's a scary question, but if you say hurt yourself, they could mean yes but they have no intention of killing themselves. So maybe they wanna burn, cut, scratch, pick, but it's not actually with intent to die. So the question is, is this an intent to die? The next question is, do you have a plan? So some people wanna die, but haven't really thought it through, don't really have a plan. They just have those feelings. Then it escalates to, do you have the means? So is it pills? Is it a weapon? Is it scissors? Um, is it a building? Um, and do you have the opportunity? So how do you remove the opportunity? So these are things that if this is happening um, in your, with your coworker, this is an important conversation to have with your coworker. And tell them that there is hope and help is on the way. So as these questions escalate so the plans the means and opportunity that's when you call 911 because that person has has it they know what they're doing and they have a plan so let's <laughs> talk about self-care so it's not about replacing feelings um so often people um don't think that they're they don't do self-care they don't stop they don't take a day off work um because they don't think their life is hard enough or they don't have, it's, it's just, I, my life is not that bad. Um, or you're in a current crisis and you don't have the time to take care of yourself. Um, 
so it's or you, you don't want to engage in those uncomfortable negative emotions that come with with stopping and looking at yourself and reflecting um so some so it's hard to value self-care and self-care can sometimes be actually negative coping skills so i'm just going to take a moment to pause and if you want to um definitely be honest with yourself and on a piece of paper or um just say it out loud what are negative coping skills that you're engaging with um particularly in this time of covid and with stress and i'm just going to be quiet for a moment and if you feel comfortable um write it in the question box and share with your community and this is a space this is not confession this is a we're in this together moment so this is this is a this is how we support each other so i'll just give you a minute for that we're getting a few folks sent um, putting things in stress snacking sleeping more alcohol thank you so much for sharing eating poorly drinking more wine chocolate Denial. Thank Hoping you. by helping others and not myself. Mm, yes, that that goes back here to cope or not to cope. Uh, someone says mental swearing. Afraid I will start swearing when my executive functions start to fail. Mm. Withdrawal, mm. panic attacks, avoiding people because I don't want to hear about what's stressing them. Procrastination. Procrastination is one because then you build, that builds on guilt and it builds on anxiety. It's definitely a spiral. Unhealthy eating uh, is, is, you know, people have talked about how COVID has affected eating. That was something that was sort of masked with my freshman 15, my freshman year, you know, everyone gains weight. So it's, it's part of, Part of the negative coping skills but let's turn that around so how do we support ourselves in uh, maintaining positive health so we recognize these behaviors in ourselves we recognize that we're not helping ourselves be our best selves what are the things that you're doing to take care of yourself and this is super important because people will ask me well what should i do for self-care and i find that better answers come from the community and from yourself because I'm just going to say the cliches <laughs> um, because I don't know what you need to take care of yourself. So let's take a moment. What are you doing to take care of yourself um, to do self-care and maintain your positive mental health? And take a moment, write it down on a piece of paper and share on the questions box. That would be really great. What are, remember yeah. one in five people are have a mental illness and four people are, in, are there for support. So there are people in your community that are here to support you. Do you want me to read some off or? or... Yeah, can okay. people read them? Uh, I can paste them in for people to see or I can just read them real quick. No, just well, read them real quick. Like, okay, take a walk watching funny animal videos, counseling and medication, um, leaving work when it just feels like too much, spending more time with cats, mm. bullet journaling, exercise, games on the iPad, taking dog to park, paint by number, reading, daily exercise, get sleep, drink water, move, yeah. kitten videos, exercise, aromatherapy, meditation, on own and deep breathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I light a candle every day. Um, it just, I do it um, to honor this part of my uh, faith tradition, to honor people that have died, but also um, as a way to sort of fill the space with positive, with positivity, with a good smell. Um, so I want to, so I only have two more slides. I want to shout out to Espen Clausen. 
if you want to have a great public speaker come and talk about mental health um, and other things, look up Espen Clausen. He is in Wisconsin. He is amazing. <laughs> So he has lots of energy, lots of great information, and he has this two-prong uh, rating for um, negative emotions. So he's very clear, like, it's okay to have negative emotions. They don't define you. And as part of your self-care, you need to learn to navigate them, right? So are you experiencing stress? Navigate the stress. Are you experiencing high levels of anxiety? Even the anxiety that is um, diagnosable as a disorder. You can do that. So take a self inventory like a pain scale. So how big of a deal does it feel? There's no wrong answer. This is for you, right? So is it one, it's really doesn't feel like that big of a deal or 10, like this is, this is unbearable. I need to do that. Um, and then how big of a deal is it? So contextualize it to yourself. When it's a 10, is it the same feeling or do you raise it or lower it accordingly, right? So like a pain scale, I uh, had gallbladder um, surgery last year as a, and I had um, the pain that happens was a, it was a 15, it was a 10, it was a 10. Um, but I could compare it to a 10 because previously I'd had kidney stones and kidney stones felt like a 10. And then in my memory, kidney stones went down to a seven and gallbladder went to a 10 because then I realized actually. So when you start to experience mental health and you're navigating your skills, you can learn to calibrate what is a 10, what is a seven, uh, what is a three. And then I will add, when can you take care of it? Can you take care of it right now? Like, is this thing that's causing you this feeling doesn't need to be addressed in this moment right now, which is a 10, or can it be put off till later? So that it's causing you distress doesn't mean you have to deal with it right away. Maybe putting it, it's like, it, I don't have to deal with it, it's a three, then that should reduce um, how big of a deal it is. Um, and really drink water, uh, drinking water literally changes the way you breathe and it resets your breathing function. So it's not just about staying hydrated and having great skin. It's, it's also about reducing your breathing, uh, not reducing your breathing, regulating your breathing and regulating your stress. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for your time um, and for your engagement. This is my contact information, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions with the time that we have left. Thank you so much. We did get a few, several questions, so I'm going to um, see how many we can get to here. One is um, sp about um, just the challenges of calling 911 and uh, as you were saying, the, the potential for tragic outcomes or if um, a black person is really worried about the police like that. How mm -hmm. do you, um, and then someone else suggested, I'm just gonna kind of pile these all in one, um, that if you're calling for an officer specifically requesting a CIT officer Excellent. is a strategy that they have done. So it, do, can you say any more about that? Yeah, actually that, um... That is a great resource. Uh, CIT is Crisis Intervention Team. And these are officers that have received 40 hours of mental health, uh, mental illness crisis de-escalation training. And they have been trained for, to do things like what we talked about in de-escalation. So keeping their hands open and visible, sitting down with the person, uh, speaking in a tone that's empathetic and thoughtful. So they're coming in with the information that you collected about what the situation is, like do they, are they hearing voices, do the voices, so all of that information that you would collect and give to dispatch will help de-escalate the situation when an officer comes. So this person is not a danger to themselves or other, this person is just in crisis. And so having it you can also and again are they in crisis if they're not in crisis you don't need to call the police so 
um, you know, it's like having, you know, schizophrenia while black, right? So having schizophrenia does not mean that you're a danger to yourself or others. It just means that you're living with a brain disorder and it may look strange to other people. And then as this person pointed out, you add the level of race and racism and relationship with between the black community and the police, you're adding, a, it, it feels like a recipe for disaster. So that the person is in crisis doesn't mean that, um, again, calling the crisis line may be an option to consider um, and handing the phone over to that person and having the person on the crisis line navigate the call is an option. So you can call the crisis line um, and then see if it needs to escalate to 911. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, there's someone who I'm just going to read the whole thing. There are some staff who often refer to a patient, uh, a patron as a schizophrenic person. Can you talk about the importance of not labeling people as their potential men mental illness, but rather as someone who is experiencing a mental illness? Yes. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, and a lot, oftentimes we find that people are like, oh, I'm such a schizo. Um, you know, I have multiple personalities and, um, oh, I have ADHD, ADD. And most people obviously would not say that <laughs> um, if they were aware of the harm that they're causing, right? So those fit under the category of macro and microaggressions, right? So those things that um, cut at people's souls and are mostly unintentional. So, oh, so it's not just about using the language to label someone, but it's also using language to that stigmatizes. So that person is 100% right. Having a mental um, illness does not define you. People don't say, I am cancer. I am liver failure. I am, you know, people say I have cancer. People say I have liver failure. Um, so to, to refer, and some people who have a mental illness may choose to use that language, but it's that person's choice. Um, but anytime that you hear someone say, hey, um, just, I I know that you, when you say you're schizo, I know that, what, I know what you're meaning is that you're kind of having a hard time concentrating and it's kind of a crazy day, but it might be worth um, considering not using that language. So that requires trust. Um, but hopefully you're building that in your community and you can address stigmatizing language. Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, there is someone who is interested in the um, connection and overlap between creative, gifted, autistic, and mentally ill people. Some symptoms are in the description of all of these brain varieties. Mm -hmm. Do you have yes. to add about that? Yeah, actually, um, communication is something that's very important to gauge and to understand. So someone that is having um, a crisis, it could be dementia, it could be autism, um, or it could be a brain, uh, a mental illness. And communication is something that is important to engage in. Um, because they may not be, they may not be a verbal communicator, they may be shutting down. Um, and so that makes it that's scary when someone isn't able to get answers to get questions um to communicate with that person and then that can escalate a situation because you're like i they're not talking i don't know what's happening they're screaming um so who you call in that context um so autism is something that presents very differently um and it's another one of those that often experiences the macro the microaggression of like Oh, but they're so functioning. Um, I couldn't tell you have autism, um, but really, um, someone who has a more severe form of autism, and I don't know that that's the correct way of expressing that. Um, their their verbal communication skills can be significantly impaired if they're in a crisis, and that can add to the stress of a situation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
here's another question. Often in a situation with the library, onlookers do or want to engage with the event if, if you're um, trying to engage with someone who's um, potentially having uh, an episode. Um, it is not always possible to remove the person to a private space, nor should you always. What can one say to those who are onlookers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, so responding to someone in a mental illness crisis is not the same as responding to someone who's having a heart attack at an airport, right, where they have um, automated defibrillator devices um, where it just tells you, like, rip the shirt open, put the buttons on, press the, press the button, and then the person. Like, not anyone can respond to someone in a mental illness crisis. And so it's important to... Um, to say like this is this is something we're trained in this is something that we are learning to respond to thank you for your help um so unless you're doing the is there a doctor on the plane um is there a social worker in the in the building um it's really important to ask people to stand back to to come to um to not engage in the situation and if it's someone that is just making people uncomfortable and they come and complain to you, you say, you know, um, this person is is not violating any library policies. And so they're able to be here um, just as much as you are. So it's, it's important to ask people to move back, to stay away, um, or if they come and complain to just say they're not violating any policies. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have um, someone who brought up, um, along with mental health first aid, there's QPR training for suicide awareness. Um, so that's another resource that someone brought up. Do you yes. have experience with that? Yes, and of course my brain is um, forgetting what QPR stands for. It's, um, it's question, persuade, refer. Thank you. Uh, and yes, so that basically follows those questions about, are you trying to kill, do you wanna kill yourself? Do you have a plan? And it is, a, it's that sitting down with someone, understanding what situation they're in, and then making a plan with them to see a therapist, to go to the hospital for self, um, to self-admit into the hospital, so QPR is an excellent resource. Related to that, someone was wondering if it's okay to ask, um, to have one of those questions be um, whether any problems would be solved by removing their presence. I, I'm, I'm not positive. Um, yeah, I would stick to the script. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would stick, because we know those are tried and true and um, it might be more like you may want to engage more in like, why don't you talk to me about what concerns you? What is it that's making you feel guilty? Um, so turn that question around into a into a conversation um, and not like what will it resolve, but instead tell tell me what it is that you're that is hurting you. Tell me what it is that's stressing you out. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for all of the information and ideas um, and resources that you've shared. Um, I am really glad that you were able to do this. Um, I wanted to mention everyone that um, this session is being recorded and the slides and, and recording will be posted on the conference website by tomorrow. Um, there's also a... Um, a survey that is coming to you both right after this and it will come in the follow-up email if you don't have time right now. Um, and we do really value that feedback. It helps us um, with planning for the next year and it helps our presenters to get more information too. Um, so if you can do that, that would be great. Our next session in this track is about teen engagement and it begins at one o'clock. We hope to see you there and if not, hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>